Okay, I know we'll have people continuing to join us, but in the interest of time, I wanna go ahead and get started. There's so much to cover this morning. Good morning and thank you for coming to our Date with the Cure event. For those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Eugenia Welch. I'm the president of Alzheimer's San Diego. Today you will have the special opportunity to hear about the latest in Alzheimer's research directly from the scientists working to find a cure. We're also very fortunate to be joined by a researcher who specializes in caregiver stress, which is such an important topic for all of us. On that note, I would like to recognize our esteemed panel for being part of this event, especially for being flexible with our new Zoom format. I also wanna thank our generous partners for supporting us this morning. Because of their continued support, all of the services we provide are at zero cost to the community. You should have all received a link to our online exhibitor scavenger hunt. It was included in the email that provided the link for this webinar. We'll also share the link again at the end of the program. If you haven't already, take a few minutes this weekend to complete the scavenger hunt. Once submitted, you'll automatically be entered into a drawing for a $50 gift certificate to the Cohen Restaurant Group. You'll have until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. to submit your um, entry, and it's really pretty fun, so please take the time to do it. Before I introduce our moderator today, I want you to know just a little bit about our organization. Alzheimer's San Diego is a local nonprofit. Our mission is to help the families affected by the disease today and find a cure for tomorrow. To that end, every dollar donated to Alzheimer's San Diego stays in San Diego County. As you can imagine, there have been some significant shifts to how we deliver our services because of COVID-19, but I'm proud to share um, how we've pivoted our essential services online since closing the office in mid-March. People living with dementia and their care partners are still able to get the help they need from our dementia experts. We're providing supportive counseling using video calls, the old-fashioned telephone, and online live chat. Our education team led by Amy Abrams has done a tremendous job launching weekly webinars and we now have a substantial webinar library on our website on topics ranging from dementia 101, communication skills, preparing to the late stage, for the late stage and much, much more. We currently have 25 support and discussion groups actively using Zoom with more on the way. And while we miss our weekly in-person social activities, we now have a library of movement and motion videos on our website. These videos demonstrate easy and safe exercises you can do at home to get your body and mind moving. We also have a team of dedicated volunteers sewing reusable cloth face masks for anyone in need. So um, if you find yourself in need of a mask, give us a call and we'll be happy to drop them in the mail to you. Finally, we have a new virtual Alls Companions program. This is a really special new program. We have volunteers from all over the world lined up and ready to do virtual visits with local families. This is a great way for someone living with dementia to get some vital socialization from a safe distance, and it can even give care partners some much needed time to recharge. We have volunteers ready and waiting, and we know from the families enrolled in this program that it is such a positive experience. I'd actually like to share a quote from one of the families with you. Doug had a lovely visit with Amelia this afternoon. He has not FaceTime much, but he caught right on and was not intimidated by the technology. It was so wonderful to see Doug fully engage with someone outside of the family. I think this will make all the difference in the world. I cannot thank you enough. So please, if you think this might be a fit for your family, give us a call. We have volunteers ready to go. My goal as the president of Alzheimer's San Diego is that someday our organization becomes irrelevant because the cure has been found. But until that day comes, it is an honor to serve our community and support local families affected by this terrible disease. Alzheimer's San Diego is also proud to award research grants through our Collaboration for Cure initiative. Since 2015, C4C has funded 14 different drug discovery projects to help find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Three of those yielded such promising results they've gone on to receive grants from the National Institutes of Health. We also work to connect people like you with incredible clinical trials going on in our backyard. More than 80% of all clinical trials fail to start on time because of a lack of participants. We won't find a cure without volunteers stepping up and taking part in research. As I've mentioned before, all of our services are 100% free of charge. We've 
we are completely supported by the generosity of our community. Two of our biggest fundraisers are coming up, our annual motorcycle ride for alls, and of course the annual walk, walk for alls. We've decided to make both of these events virtual this year. There's no amount of money we could raise that's worth putting your health at risk. We have some fun and innovative ideas on how to keep these incredible events um, fun and to keep the spirit alive, even though they'll be virtual. While I know motor motorcycle riding might not be for everyone, um, who doesn't really love a good walk? I'm hoping all of you here today will sign up for the Walk for Alls. It's free to register. If you do like to ride, the Rides for Alls is less than a month away and all bikes are welcome. You can learn more about both events at the links in the chat field. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Amy Abrams. She's sure to be a familiar face to those of you who have attended our community education classes and more recently our Zoom classes. Amy has dedicated her life to helping people living with dementia and their care partners, and we are incredibly lucky to have her as the Director of Education at Alzheimer's San Diego. Amy, it's all up to you now. Thank you, Eugenia. I'm so excited to be here this morning. Uh, before we get things underway, just a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, today's program is being broadcast using Zoom webinar. So if you're familiar with Zoom, but you usually use it for meetings or video conferencing, there's just a couple little differences we want to make sure that you're aware of. So all attendees in the webinar have been muted to reduce background noise and distractions, but we very much want for you to be asking questions and to participate. So to help us keep track of questions, there's a feature in Zoom webinar called Q&A. Uh, you can find it in the black uh, control bar on your screen, which will either be up at the top or the bottom, depending on what kind of a device you're on. When you click on that button in your control panel, it's going to pop up a box that looks like this, which you see on screen here. So if you have a question for one of the researchers, please type it in and click send. And we'll be able to see your questions and we'll get as many of them answered during the Q&A portion of the program here today as we can. So please feel free, you don't have to wait until Q&A, uh, feel free to submit questions as they uh, come to mind. Uh, depending upon what type of a device you're using and how big your screen or your monitor is, that Q&A box can be large and may cover up part of the presentation. So just click on this little uh, minimize button here and that will, um, hide, that will hide that box from you. So we'll ask you to please keep your questions limited to the Q&A box. Um, there is also a chat function in Zoom webinar, and that's where, if you haven't seen it already, that's where we'll be sending out links and, uh, and materials. Um, please remember, too, that Alzheimer's San Diego's team of local dementia care consultants is always here to help. So if you're in need of more uh, information, some personal support, and want to talk with one of our social workers, we'll be reminding you at the end of the program about how you can reach them. And finally, this program is being recorded and a link to that recording and a copy of the slides that our presenters will be speaking from will be sent out uh, early next week. Finally, if you're having any difficulty during the webinar today, please don't let yourself get frustrated. We've got three wonderful uh, Alzheimer's San Diego volunteers with us here today. Um, me, Sierra, and Richie, will you uh, wave to our folks and say hello. Um, we're so wow. happy to have these members of our volunteer tech team with us here today. If you're having questions, difficulty with audio settings or your screen, you want to see things differently on the screen, um, put a message in the chat or just call our office 858-492-4400 and we can connect you by phone with one of our volunteers who can talk you through um, any technical issues that you're having. So they're here to help with whatever you need. Um, my thanks uh, to, to our volunteers. So as Eugenia mentioned, I have spent my uh, professional life working with people living with dementia and their care partners. So I know how important this event is to you, how many questions you have. I know the things you read, the things you see in the news, and I know it can be really hard to separate facts from fiction. Um, the quacks from the facts, as we like to say here at Alzheimer's San Diego. Um, I'm delighted to give you this opportunity today to get your questions answered directly by the experts. 
The researchers on this panel are truly extraordinary. They are the reason that a cure for dementia could very well be found here in San Diego County. Each member of, of this esteemed panel is going to take a minute now uh, to introduce themselves and talk a bit about their area of research and expertise. First up, we have Dr. Paul Ason with the USC Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute. Thank you, Amy and Gina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to everyone for tuning in this morning. Um, for those of you who haven't been at this event before, um, I am from the USC Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute. We are an academic team that works with uh, NIH funding and, and in partnership with pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies to find and test new therapies for Alzheimer's disease. We've been at this for a long time, for over 30 years. It's, uh, it's a long haul. Um, many uh, clinical trials are disappointing, but even as we conduct many studies, we are learning much more about the disease and about how to identify people with this disease and measure progression of the disease, and those are the tools we need to conduct our clinical trials. Uh, there have been major advances, particularly over the past uh, five to 10 years, that have revolutionized our understanding of the disease and of uh, how we can intervene to slow the disease down. So we used to think of Alzheimer's disease as lasting seven to 10 years, uh, from the onset of symptoms and mild dementia uh, to the uh, severe stages. We now have changed our idea of what this disease is, and it's not a seven to 10 year disease, it's actually over 25 years. The spectrum of Alzheimer's disease lasts a quarter of a century in each individual. And while it's very complicated, it starts with a single process. And on this slide, that's shown in the red line, and that's amyloid, an abnormal protein, also called A-beta, that accumulates in brain and aggregates into the plaques that you may have heard of. And the amyloid plaques are the start of the disease, and they drive the disease forward. But uh, these amyloid plaques start to uh, accumulate at the beginning of the spectrum, and over the 25 years, and the 15 years before symptoms begin, uh, many other changes occur in the brain, and they include the development of tangles, the other uh, brain finding that's made up of uh, tau protein, and loss of brain function, loss of synapses, changes to the cells, and cell death. We now understand this, and we can measure it in living people. Uh, we use uh, brain scanning techniques, amyloid PET and tau PET. We have great blood tests now that show us how all these changes occur. We have cognitive tests, uh, memory tests that we can give to people that identify changes even a decade or more before symptoms occur. And all of these are the critical tools in understanding how to slow down the disease. At ATRI, we conduct studies of candidate therapeutics across the whole spectrum. Um, the field in general has focused on amyloid or A-beta because it's the earliest change and it drives the disease. It starts it off and causes the other changes. And we now have candidate therapies that can remove amyloid from brain that can normalize this abnormality. And we're very excited about this and continue to launch large scale international studies of candidate therapeutics that can remove amyloid from brain. And we do this at the very earliest point of amyloid accumulation while the brain is still normal and while other abnormalities have not yet occurred. We think this is the most promising approach and we're currently launching our largest study to date called AHEAD 345 using amyloid normalization at this very early stage of disease. But uh, even as we uh, continue with our anti-amyloid studies, we're also studying many other interventions at all stages of the disease because 
we have an obligation to develop the best treatments we can for everybody affected by this disease. And we're working from primary prevention through early intervention, through studies in all phases of disease, and the outlook is, uh, is good. We, we are going to have success in the coming years, despite all the failures you've read about. We've learned so much more about the disease that we're confident of success in the coming years. I better stop there, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Asen. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Jim Brewer with UCSD's Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, thanks, Amy, and thanks, Eugenia, and thanks the entire Alzheimer's San Diego team for pulling this together despite all the challenges of this uh, pandemic. And thank you to the participants for making it work and, and navigating the technology to be here with us. So I'm excited to share what we're doing very briefly and to answer your questions afterwards. So uh, I, uh, I am a neurologist and uh, um, uh, researcher uh, focusing on uh, brain imaging and biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease that uh, Paul had mentioned. Some of these really exciting advances that uh, allow us to now see in humans the process of the disease. And, and as Paul mentioned, we can now see this so many years before symptoms start. And I think that does lend a lot of promise to the research studies that are going on at this point. Um, very, very important uh, is uh, the environment in which you are uh, conducting this work. And we are so lucky to be in San Diego. It really is a fantastic place to be doing this work. I trained at Stanford and Johns Hopkins, uh, but really the environment here is unmatched. And I think when I decided to come here, there was not a person at any of those top universities that questioned the decision to come to UC San Diego and the San Diego environment. What I have on this left side of the slide here is, you know, squeezed into a single slide, which was what our rules were. But you really just, uh, the main take home point is that this is just a super exciting environment in which to do Alzheimer's disease research. Our Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is housed within the neurosciences department, which I chair at UC San Diego. And I can, I see firsthand what an incredibly vibrant environment this is for neurosciences more broadly and uh, the Alzheimer's research here uh, benefits from that. So the UC San Diego Neurosciences Department is the number one NIH funded uh, neurosciences department in the nation. In fact, number one by over $10 million per year above second ranked Johns Hopkins. So just to let you know the kind of incredible neuroscience environment in which we sit even just on the campus, but you broaden out that circle and you go to not only the medical school, but to the campus and the Mesa. And you're gonna hear from some of our excellent partners at Sanford Burnham Prebus Medical Discovery Institute and the collaborations that can happen in this really uh, tight knit uh, scientific environment. And then you go out even further to that and you look at our industry partners, places like Qualcomm and Illumina, Quest Diagnostics, which is just right up the road in one of the main research centers. And then of course in the community with Alzheimer's San Diego and a whole host of community partners. The Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center has been in the community for 35 years, been continuously funded by the National Institute on Aging for 35 years. And uh, through that, we've really, uh, really built some deep roots in the community with the partners that you've heard uh, talked about. But also one of the real pushes that we'd like to do, and this is point two, we need broad and diverse participation in human research studies. And we, the other piece of this that really benefits from the San Diego environment is that we also have a very diverse community here. Uh, we have uh, at the Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center has, have uh, recognized this need across the nation. And we've taken up the uh, call to try to broaden the diversity of our participants. And to do that, we set up a uh, Latino cohort that is actually going to benefit from a South Bay uh, satellite center in the South Bay uh, Latino Research Center so that we can do a better job reaching the South Bay community and broadening our research to include uh, participants of all uh, backgrounds. Uh, that middle section really just talks about our process of how we really characterize the individuals genetically, imaging-wise, cognitively, and uh, including a very new, exciting 
another new core that we just started this last cycle. It's called induced pluripotent stem cells. This I think is going to be a remarkably important advancement. It is using human cells to turn them into neurons and then study the process in a dish. That allows our researchers in the broader neurosciences environment to really look at the molecular pathways of this disease in humans. This is a very human disease. And I think one of the things we've learned over the past 20, 30 years is that mouse models are fantastic for a component of the disease, certainly very key, key piece of the research, but it's missing some important aspects because this is a human disease. And we've seen the disease that we sometimes call Mouseheimer's cured many times, and we've never cured the human Alzheimer's disease. So I think this is our step to be able to look in humans and make use of the really exciting advances in genetics that allow us to understand the pieces of this disease that are driven by genetics. Because we do know in the humans, if you have genetic risk factors, there is a different pathway going on. We know that it actually changes your onset of this disease. Uh, therefore, if we could develop a drug that actually changed a bad genotype into a good genotype, we know we'd make, a, we'd make a move here. So we need to understand the differences between a good genotype and a bad genotype, and that's gonna be a roadmap for us to make an impact here. So on the right, point three, characterizing this disease in humans is key to making research advances and our ability to do this are developing and truly amazing. I don't have time to talk all about it, but there are many different cell types in the brain and each of these may be playing a role in the process of Alzheimer's disease. Because we're here in a super exciting genetics, uh, scientific research environment, including uh, Illumina again, and, and the, the biotech industry here, we are really at the forefront of using genetic tools, not only to better characterize this disease in humans, but also to make an impact in therapies. There was a really amazing advance that happened also here in San Diego. Ionis Pharmaceuticals developed a uh, uh, anti-sense oligonucleotide. We can talk more about this, but I think it's an extremely exciting approach to target genetic features of different neurodegenerative diseases, and it's very adaptable. It may be a new approach that we might be able to use to be able to uh, truly impact neurodegenerative illnesses. And the one the story about it is that a disease in children called spinal muscular atrophy, which is actually a neurodegenerative illness, was able to be targeted through this new therapy and actually completely changed the approach, uh, changed the outcome of those children that had this neurodegenerative illness called spinal muscular atrophy. I can assure you spinal muscular atrophy is not the only disease that's going to be amenable to this new type of therapy. And we're going to be looking at it strongly here at UC San Diego and our partners. Uh, our close uh, colleague Don Cleveland really won the, a, a very prestigious breakthrough award uh, for his uh, advances in antisense oligonucleotides, and I'm super excited about the advances we might be able to make on that. So that's what I'll leave it, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Brewer. I'm sure that um, these uh, introductions are bringing up some really great questions in everyone's mind, so just to Reminder to submit your questions using that Q&A box uh, as they're coming up for you. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Gerald Chun. <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. Gerald Chun from the Sanford Burnham Prebus Medical Discovery Institute. Great, thank you very much, Amy, and it's uh, really a delight to be here again. And uh, to all of you, it's been uh, certainly a trying time in sort of honor of brighter times ahead. I've got my Aloha shirt on and believe it or not, it's summertime as well. So I think there'll be brighter times ahead. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we're pursuing at San Sanford Burnham Prebus or SBP, Medical Discovery Institute. Uh, we're a private nonprofit organization and we pursue uh, academic basic science as well as translational science that you'll hear a bit more about from TC in a, in, in a few minutes. And we're all part of the same community as you heard from Jim and from Paul. So uh, we all see each other, interact a lot. In fact, we have many, many of us have ties that go way, way back. And that provides really a, a great environment for us to both uh, interact and make discoveries. And the story I'll tell you about today actually uh, kind of comes from some of that cooperation. And uh, what I'd like to uh, show you in this slide are, are three uh, notions that uh, underlie both our normal brain as well as aspects of uh, Alzheimer's disease. 
So at the top there with this sort of rainbow colored uh, picture of a brain uh, is the notion that your brain is what we call a genomic mosaic. So a mosaic is of course uh, many different components that come together, for example, in tiles in ancient Rome or uh, Greek uh, mosaics that form a, a, an intact picture. And in this case, it's the many, many, many cells of our, our brain that appear to have distinct genomes. So we're, we're taught that, well, every single cell in our body has the same genome, but that turns out to be uh, inaccurate. In fact, in the brain, it's quite probable that every single cell has a distinct genome. That is, this DNA sequence actually varies from cell to cell. And that sequence is the blueprint from which all of our cells, and indeed our whole body, arise. So genomic mosaicism uh, describes this difference in the blueprint that's present amongst all of these many cells in the brain. And how many cells are there? Hundreds of billions. In fact, it's probably several hundred billion different cells that are present and make up the human brain. And that's, that's very important uh, in terms of thinking about the brain because many of the studies that we currently pursue uh, look at genes that were identified elsewhere in the body, not within the brain. And so we took a different approach, which is to actually look at the actual brain cells and ask the question of what might be going on there. And what arose from some of those studies was uh, shown in number two in the picture of sort of the tinker toy looking colorful uh, icons there and uh, the writing that says the blueprint is altered by a process called somatic gene recombination. So what is somatic gene recombination? Well, it takes a normal gene, in this case, an Alzheimer's disease gene given the name APP. It's, it's important, it's, it's a causal gene in rare families, but it takes the, the genes that uh, normally are present as two copies and it actually expands them vastly and modifies both the numbers and forms of those genes within individual cells of one individual. And that this may in fact produce a range of, uh, you could say mutations amongst these genes that uh, are, are present in individuals, but then that this may be a common type of phenomenon that alters uh, genes both in Alzheimer's disease and perhaps other diseases as well. And it's an interesting uh, fact that many people with Alzheimer's disease also have other neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease or frontal temporal dementia. And so this type of a mechanism could underlie both by acting on different sets of genes. Now, a very important aspect of the gene structures that are created uh, is that these different uh, variant genes require an enzyme that's present in our bodies. Uh, this is called reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase takes RNAs, so you'll remember that we go from DNA to RNA to protein. Uh, this enzyme reverses the RNA's information, sticks it back into the DNA. And so that type of function uh, is something that has been observed in viruses for, for many, many years, such as the retroviruses, such as HIV in particular. But uh, in this case, it's required for this form of gene recombination. So that's raised the possibility that if you could interrupt that process with say a drug that inhibits reverse transcriptases, that you might be able to impact uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular and perhaps other neurodegenerative diseases. And so at this point in history, there are in fact many, many reverse transcriptase inhibitors that are FDA approved. They've actually been in humans uh, in the marketplace since 1987. So we have many, many decades of uh, safety information that uh, supports the at least potential use of these agents. And current uh, research looking at both uh, the, the possibility that this type of an enzyme could be inhibited to reduce these types of recombination mechanisms, as well as reduce Alzheimer's disease are uh, currently in progress. And there's several initial stage uh, trials that are beginning to look at this uh, phenomenon, as well as basic science that is going on to understand 
how you could potentially inhibit these reverse transcriptases. And as you heard from Jim, perhaps using antisenses, uh, antisense strategies to inhibit the production of the toxic variants that we could go about and uh, reduce Alzheimer's disease from that perspective. So I thank you for uh, your attention, of course, and uh, if you have questions, just please uh, send them in and uh, I'll look forward to uh, responding to them. Thanks so much, Dr. Chun. Now we'll hear from Dr. Thomas T.C. Chung, uh, who is also with Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute. Hi, thank you, Amy, and thank you, Gina, and I'd like to thank the Alzheimer's San Diego for this opportunity. So it's a mouthful. I'm a director of this long-named Translational Programs Outreach. What it really means is I have the pleasure of uh, catalyzing research and managing research programs with various researchers around the world. Very briefly, um, I ended up managing research rather than being in the lab doing research because I get easily bored and peripatetic. And my entire history has been one of uh, movement and taking on new skills and being multidisciplinary. I, uh, like Gerald, grew up in Hawaii, so we have matching Aloha shirts. Um, I trained at MIT, went to Berkeley, uh, went to Stanford and finished up at Berkeley. I went to Harvard briefly and went to USC Medical School even more briefly. Finally, ended up in pharmaceutical companies, five, and then uh, promoted up and out, and I joined academic research. Uh, and I actually, prior to running this um, San translational program here at Stanford Burnham, uh, uh, with the Sanford Burnham, I actually managed for seven years the NIH um, Molecular Libraries Association a project where uh, the Previs Center actually was a key component of that, where I have built a gigantic robotic facility, spent $20 million, and had the pleasure of working with 147 PIs over seven years at 47 institutes in five countries. So that's what qualifies me to work, work here. So three things I wanted to do to talk about the collaboration with CURE is the collaboration for CURE is a component of the San Diego Alzheimer's Project, which was actually started in uh, 2014, I would say under the leadership of Diane Jacob, the supervisor of the uh, county, um, San Diego County, with uh, participation with the Alzheimer's San Diego. So then in, uh, later that year, the collaboration CURE was formed with the sponsorship of um, Diane Jacob, also in San Diego, Mayor Kevin Faulkner and Darlene Shiley, which many of you know. And we are actually just finished our fifth call for proposals. The mechanism of that is it, it seeds early translation efforts. What that really means is it, it takes a lot of time and you have to have something called preliminary data to apply for grants from the NIH. You have to show that it kind of works before they give you money to, to show it works better. And so, what, what the collaboration for CURE is, it calls for uh, letters of intent and then proposals, which the committee views and looks at. And if it uh, has good legs, then it's assigned to the Previs Center and other drug screening centers to uh, put its um, skill set of drug discovery and automation and convert those ideas into early assays or tests that can be uh, put into uh, a large robotic system. And there are very specific grant mechanisms that the NIH and the DOD actually have to look at Alzheimer related research. And with a little bit of preliminary data then will attract and be competitive for larger research grants. The exciting thing about the Collaboration for Cure is that's actually seeded innovation in terms of the kinds of targets related to Alzheimer's that cover the entire uh, early stages, amyloid, the middle stages, tangles, and the later stages, uh, neuroinflammation. So we have actually seeded projects in all of those areas. And as Jim had mentioned, induced pluripotent stem cells is a big component of that. And Ann Bang in our center actually has uh, shown great success in forming three-dimensional models and repro reprogramming neurons and actually having functional assays that we can reduce brains into dishes. As a measure of success, uh, I'm happy to report this is uh, C4C model of leverage taking catalytic seed funds and attracting larger grants has actually worked. And we have actually attracted uh, with an investment of about, you know, quarter of a, about, you know, $700,000. We actually attracted over uh, $6 million of grants at this point. 
Uh, we have three very large grants. We just found out we got another grant last week. So it really represents a good uh, leverage, but more importantly, these will actually lead to substantial advances. So that's what I wanted to share. And I hope uh, it, uh, it's uh, of interest to everyone. And I thank you for your opportunity and look forward to the questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Chun. Chun, we have um, been hearing a lot about uh, the disease, the work that's happening here locally related to treatment and cure um, for the person living with dementia, but we don't forget about the people um, that, the other people that this affects, the families and caregivers. So next we'll be hearing from Dr. Brent Mosbach, who is a clinical psychologist with UC San Diego Health and an expert in caregiver stress. Thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you, Eugenia, and everyone at the Alzheimer's San Diego for working so hard to put this event together. It's truly, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I also want to say thank you to the attendees and to anyone who's out there who's volunteered for any of the research on Alzheimer's or in caregiving, really. Um, we really don't have science unless we have the many volunteers who've taken part in the research. And so I just want to say thank you to anyone and, and just do your best. Volunteer in the research if you can and uh, support it as, as many ways as you can as well. Um, as Amy said, I'm Brent Mosbach. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California at San Diego. Uh, my background, as she mentioned as well, is in clinical psychi psychology, I should say. Um, and for the past 20 years, I've been interested in the impacts of caregiving on the overall well-being of the caregiver. That would include psychological well-being, emotional well-being, but we focused a lot on physical well-being of the caregiver as well and the links between emotional, psychological, and physical well-being. So as you can see on my slide here, um, we, when we began our research, it was really focused at the beginning on the emotional uh, well-being of the caregiver and some of the physical consequences that we were looking at were downstream things like um, uh, cardiovascular diseases or hypertension in particular. And uh, I was out golfing one time in Palm Springs, and as this was many years before COVID came out, and I was matched with some strangers, and as would be typical when you do this, you start having a conversation, so, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? What do you do for work? And I told them what I do. I said, I look at the, the, the links between stress and, and health. And uh, one of the guys said, well, of course, everyone knows that when you're stressed, your health suffers. And so uh, I had to explain to them, that the focus of my research was really on the why. What is happening within the person's body that's leading to some of these outcomes like cardiovascular diseases and hypertension. And so what we've, what we've been focused on from the early times is that the caregivers, when they become stressed, we noticed that they had more active sympathetic nervous systems, more adrenaline and, and epinephrine and noradrenaline going into the system. And that may cause some level of shear stress or, or uh, friction or, or um, uh, against the arteries and that may release coagulation molecules in the caregiver systems and inflammation starts to happen within the body. And uh, a lot of the research that we did definitely showed that we do have higher caregivers who are under the greatest levels of stress have higher levels of inflammation in their body and the coagulation that system becomes more active. And those things tended to put caregivers at higher risk for cardiovascular diseases and hypertension. And we demonstrated that those caregivers who were under the greatest stress and who had um, the greatest level of distress, emotional distress in terms of depressive symptoms, were at 400 percent greater risk for developing some form of cardiovascular disease over an 18-month period. The latest research that we've been focusing on, though, is, okay, now that we know that caregivers' health and well-being tends to suffer, is there anything that we can do about it? So for the past 10 or more years, we've been doing clinical trials, testing out whether programs and interventions designed to reduce the level of stress and, and distress that caregivers experience, does that have any impact not only on the emotional well-being, but the physical well-being? And sure enough, we've done some trials that we've shown that caregivers who receive um, effective interventions for helping with the emotional distress also show that inflammation tends to go down uh, and overall health seems to improve. So um, uh, that was an encouraging thing. But as I was um, thinking about this, we've been showing for almost the past three decades that there are interventions that seem to help caregivers reduce distress, but many of these interventions do not seem to be accessible to caregivers. 
So the latest uh, shift in our focus has been how can we get information and treatments to the caregivers in such a way as that it's convenient for them and doesn't require a great deal of time or effort on their parts. And so what we've done, and it seems very timely at this time, um, is we've put together a technology-based intervention that people can learn skills and implement those skills and see whether those skills are impacting their overall well-being right on their smartphones. Um, and so they do not have to go meet with caregivers. People do not have to have, uh, I'm sorry, do not have to meet with treatment specialists or interventionists or therapists. Um, they can have conversations on the phone that teach materials, but then keep track of what they're learning on their phones and put those things into place. And uh, we're testing that out at the current time. And that's the direction of our future research is to see whether that kind of an intervention in the age of COVID has uh, positive impacts for caregivers well-being. So that's just my brief presentation. And uh, I wish the best to everyone who's there uh, providing care for their loved ones. Thank you so much, Dr. Maswak. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Michael Plopper, who is with the Sharp Clinical Research Center, who is the title sponsor of this event. Dr. Plopper. Thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you, Eugenia, and uh, the other panelists, uh, as well as all you participants out there. Uh, this, we live in this uh, community, which was referenced by Dr. Brewer, which is uh, very much influenced by academia and uh, other thought leaders who um, uh, are leading the charge in uh, looking for a cure for Alzheimer's disease. We're very lucky to be in this community uh, uh, because of the, uh, all the efforts that are taking place uh, in, in trying to find a cure. <coughs> I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. I'm with Sharp Healthcare and have been here uh, for a long, long time. Been doing clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease for uh, about 25 years. Uh, so I've witnessed the uh, successes, the early successes, and now the failures of recent years, but also the sort of the refinement of information such that studies are becoming more specific, uh, safer, and uh, better able to be uh, implemented by uh, people like me who are carrying out clinical trials in the community. So there are so many benefits to participating in, in clinical research and particularly Alzheimer's research, but one of them is to take control of your diagnosis. I mean, this is one of those things that, uh, you know, we worry and fret about, particularly as we start to develop uh, memory changes, particularly if we have a family history and this is a way very early on in uh, the course of uh, potentially having Alzheimer's disease to get involved in research and potentially stave it off. The, uh, so participation helps us find new treatments, helps us find better diagnostic methods, and uh, potentially an actual cure. The, the, the involvement is not insignificant. Uh, we ask people to uh, go through a number of rigorous uh, um, assessments early on to determine if they have the disorder and also to uh, uh, understand what's in store. The, uh, we always want a study partner that could be a, uh, a spouse, uh, a sibling, a good friend who has frequent contact with the person uh, who will be participating. So we always want that level of participation. There are a number of trials we're doing, uh, including the uh, AHEAD A345 trial that Dr. Azen referenced, uh, which uh, does uh, include a, uh, a lengthy um, level of involvement. It could be up to four years. Uh, that does involve infusions the, uh, uh, of medication uh, on a regular basis. What we've experienced with other trials of the monoclonal antibodies looking at treatments for Alzheimer's disease is that uh, people uh, become very engaged in research, don't really seem to mind the infusions or the uh, assessments, and become very much our partner as we uh, attempt to uh, find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. So we've been very gratified by the degree of engagement from the community, by volunteers from the community, and ask you, uh, because of your primary interest, to con strongly consider becoming involved in a trial. And these range from trials for preclinical Alzheimer's disease, where a person really doesn't have any symptoms, but can be demonstrated to have an amyloid burden, 
uh, to mild cognitive impairment, to early Alzheimer's disease, and even to moderate uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we have trials to address all levels and different formulations uh, from infusions to oral medications, to even a topical medication, which we're studying. So um, we ask you to become involved. Uh, this is an exciting time. It's an exciting time to participate. And uh, we very much uh, uh, appreciate your involvement with us today and look forward to hearing from you and answering your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Plopper. Finally, we'll be hearing from Dr. Sari, excuse me, Sherry Sefji uh, with Excel Research. Good morning, everyone. I'm very thankful to Alzheimer's San Diego for continuing to host this most important event every year, and especially for inviting me to be on the panel this year. Um, I'm gonna sort of tag on to what Dr. Plopper just said. Uh, he and I do a lot of the same things, except that I'm what's called an independent clinical research site. And I'm gonna speak a little more to the nuts and bolts of what it's like to take part in a clinical trial. Um, my partner, Dr. Konovitz and I started Excel Research 15 years ago because we believe strongly in the development of new treatments. Uh, we have a very diverse professional team that have worked together for years, but I also have a personal investment in helping develop new medications, new treatments for Alzheimer's because I have family that are affected and because it's always been one of the illnesses that I most fear to have myself. Um, being an independent clinical trial site just means that I'm not affiliated with a healthcare system or a university. Um, there are several excellent independent clinical trial sites in San Diego doing Alzheimer's research. You can see which sites are participating in which clinical trials on the website clinicaltrials.gov. Each site investigator, like myself, makes their own decision about which studies that they're going to participate in, and no one, no one site takes part in every study that is being done. The pharmaceutical companies who have a medication they need to test create the clinical trials, and every site doing that trial uses the exact same uh, study protocol. The difference between sites is the doctor in charge and what the office and the staff are like. You should always expect to feel comfortable with the environment and the professionalism of the staff. So now I'm gonna describe a little more about what happens when you participate in a clinical trial. Your first interaction will usually be a phone call in which someone asks you a lot of questions to determine if you may be eligible for one of the studies that that site is doing. Um, the first in-office visit requires the study participant and the study partner to be there to be provided with all the facts that they're going to need in order to decide if they're willing to participate in that study, and that's called the informed consent process. Every study is different, but in general, Alzheimer's studies require memory testing or cognitive testing, as well as physical testing, including blood and urine. Most require an MRI of the brain, as well as PET scans, sometimes more than one of the brain. Um, there's FDG PET, Tau PET, and MOI PET. Uh, study participation usually will last from one to four years, but you can always discontinue your participation at any time. Each office visit can take from one to four hours, and office visits are typically every two to four weeks. All the procedures that are done as part of the study are at no cost to you, and sometimes there's a stipend um, given to you to help cover your cost of transportation and travel, and um, time. Um, since many insurance companies do not cover PET scans, uh, taking part in a research study is one way to get those tests done at no charge. So as Dr. Plopper alluded to as well, taking part in a clinical trial does undoubtedly require significant time, effort, and some risks. However, until there's a treatment available that can slow or stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease, taking an experimental medication may still be your best option. Clinical trials are the final, and in my view, the most important step in the development of effective medications. Even if the medicines work in mice, if they don't work in humans, we haven't gained anything. These trials cannot take place without you, the volunteer. So I also encourage you to consider taking part in the clinical trial. And I also look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sefci. This is uh, such an impressive group that we have with us here this morning. I am awed and intimidated, um, but in a, in a very good way. So we're, we're just getting started. Um, so those who are affected by Alzheimer's and 
other kinds of dementia, those of us who work with these families know they need information and helping you find reliable information about symptom management, research opportunities, um, community resources, that's a key part of our mission here at Alzheimer's San Diego. I know from my daily interactions with a lot of you, um, the quantity of information that's out there is overwhelming and it can be really difficult to tease out the, the pseudoscience from the credible scientific evidence when it comes to you know, what we really know about the prevention and treatment of dementia. Of course, all of us, um, our ability to discern fact from fiction is impacted heavily by our emotions around these issues and the various types of bias that impact us. So here we have your chance to get questions answered directly from some of the most renowned scientists in the field, um, not by scouring the wilds of the internet or reading a book from someone who's trying to sell you something. Um, we've been gathering, uh, I have this incredible list of questions uh, that's been gathering from the audience. Um, so I'm excited to get us started. Okay. I'm going to start with a question for, uh, I think a lot of you can probably address this, but I'll start with Dr. Asen. Um, what impact or impacts would you say uh, the pandemic uh, is currently having on the state of Alzheimer's and related dementias research? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, the pandemic has had quite a substantial effect on all forms of research as uh, laboratories have uh, shut down temporarily and clinical research sites have shut down temporarily or decreased their activity. As a result, there has been a pause to many studies, particularly observational studies. Uh, and for therapeutic trials, there has been a temporary interruption of treatment to uh, many participants. So the pandemic has really been a challenge for research in the field. But I think the good news is that uh, we have uh, determined how we can continue our studies, how we can connect with participants and collect information remotely, uh, how we can adjust our studies to uh, deal with the challenges of the pandemic, and so I'm pleased to say that despite the impact of the pandemic, uh, all of our studies are moving forward and we will get conclusive results nonetheless. Anyone add anything to that? Well, How are I, things? I would echo that as well, uh, directing the center at UC San Diego, which uh, the, the Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we had to adapt very quickly to protect staff and our uh, elderly participants. We have over 500 individuals uh, enrolled in the study and uh, we quickly adapted our team to, um, uh, first of all, to work from home. That was the one piece of it. And then um, asked them to, instead of uh, cognitively assessing our patients at their visits, we ended up every individual, whether they were due for a visit or not, we get a phone call just to see how they were doing because it was remarkable to see the kind of stress that, you know, I'm talking to Brent about stress, there was a tremendous amount of stress going on and even some food insecurity that we identified amongst the, the cohort that we were able to uh, intervene in by tying them into our uh, social work uh, and support group uh, capabilities that transition quickly to online. And then as Paul mentioned, uh, remote testing, uh, was something I'd say is a silver lining of what was added through this. We really, really ramped up our ability to do video visits and remote uh, acquisition of still cognitive information. And I, I'm very, even before this pandemic, I was really trying to think about ways that we could do outreach to the South Bay uh, for providing some of that academic input to the South. Uh, you know, you think it's close by, we're in the same community, but in fact, during those uh, when, when the traffic is bad, it's like driving to Orange County or something for some of our participants. So I wanted to put in telehealth as a way to outreach to the South Bay. And I think this one positive thing is that we really got good as, at telehealth now on the clinical side and on the research side. So I think there are some positive things to take away from this, but certainly it was a stressful experience. 
experience. So I would add, uh, this is Tom Chung, I would add in from a basic research, uh, in the lab type work, our uh, actual technical staff and the scientists that have to actually conduct physical experiments, we are working in shifts and we're uh, maintaining social distancing, which is a little bit of a choreographed dance when people are there and um, access to machinery and laboratory instrumentation has been a challenge. An unexpected challenge was, uh, in fact, it was that when you order uh, research reagents, they don't come as quickly as we typically get. And in certain cases, there are global shortages of certain key reagents, especially for our center, which conducts things in the hundreds of thousands of tests per day kind of level. So that was one unexpected thing. In terms of uh, attention of researchers, we are all inundated here while we're doing our core research to also participate and uh, apply for COVID-related research grants. So that has been a challenge, but a good one in a sense. So far, that has not detracted from the so total sum of funds toward our current research because it's, it's new money, not old money being redistributed. So that's been good in that sense. Thank you. So I have the, the general sense that um, things have changed dramatically, um, but that a lot of safeguards are in place to protect the health and safety of the, the study staff as well as the, the participants. That's great to hear. Dr. Brewer, my next question is, uh, is for you. You mentioned the Latino cohort um, down in uh, the South Bay. Can you speak more broadly about what is currently known, understood about the relationship between health disparities um, in different uh, populations in the U.S. and risk prevalence of Alzheimer's disease? Thanks so much for that question. I think it's extremely important and I think it's, it's fantastic that the uh, society is becoming more aware of the disparities that are kind of insidious in so many different ways and they actually do uh, include disparities in uh, health provision <laughs> not only not only in provision but actually uh, understanding the bases so so much of what we know about the genetic bases of Alzheimer's disease are coming from uh, you know European ancestry studies we uh, really had very little participation of other individuals beyond European background. Um, and so I say this as a, as a call to action for the Latino community. All this work on APOE4, all this tremendous effort to say, wow, APOE4 is a remarkable, uh, promising approach. If we could just turn an APOE4 into an APOE2 through some sort of genetic manipulation or a drug that, uh, that adapts that pathway, you're going to have an effect. Evidence is suggesting that, in fact, APOE4 is a much less important risk factor in Latinos. And we always wondered whether that was due to maybe a, a different approach to um, uh, diagnosis, or maybe there was some more vascular impacts there. Maybe it was vascular dementia that people were seeing instead of Alzheimer's disease. No, in fact, because of the Latino participation in the Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, including participation in autopsy studies, we have been able to look through our entire cohort of uh, 35 years of collecting uh, pathologic tissue from individuals, including Latinos, and find individuals that have been confirmed to have Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain and look at the genetic underpinnings and we found a much less impact of APOE4. So that then tells you, oh my gosh, can you imagine the horrific impact of developing a drug through all of this taxpayer dollars going toward addressing APOE4, and that drug does not impact the Latino community who are suffering from the same disease. That would be the worst outcome of this. And there, the way, to, the way to, uh, it, to address it is to get more participation from a more diverse uh, set of individuals so that we can say, look, yes, that APOE4 line of research is going to be very helpful for the European individuals, but we do not want to leave behind the Latino uh, community. And therefore, we really need participation. We are out using the Promotora network and collaboration with our community partners to try to enhance that message. And luckily at our center, we actually have made impacts in the participation, not only the participation, but also understanding of the importance to uh, provide autopsy at the end. Because a lot of times the cultural, uh, the cultural attitude toward things like biomarker, genetic testing, there's a lot of distrust. I mean, why are these 
La Jolla scientists seeking to get our genetics from the South Bay, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, and then asking for our brains. You know, this is something we need to understand better to the ability to uh, let them know, let the, the broader community know how important it is to participate in research. And so that's what we've done with our center. And if you look, we've completely doubled down on this. We've, we've um, hired a tremendous number of bicultural, bilingual staff to really be able to uh, understand the cultural needs uh, of that community and, and how to uh, best engage them and get them, get them interested. And uh, going down to the South Bay with the Promotora Network, I think we've made major impact. We've definitely laid our bets that this is going to be a way we can do this. And then one final thing, I don't want to go on and on, but uh, the, the linkage between that outreach effort and the super top-notch science that's going on on the Mesa, you know, uh, allows us not only to do that science here, but also with induced pluripotent stem cells, which in fact are not stem cells from, uh, you know, they're, they're taken from the forearm of the participant and transformed. So this is not from... Uh, other sources of stem cells is from the individual's skin punch biopsy and then transformed into any cell you'd like in the body. Uh, those can then be um, expanded and sent to the top science uh, labs in the country. So in fact, this outreach effort combined with our induced pluripotent stem cell approach allows us not only to do things right here in, in San Diego, but if there's exciting work going on at Mayo Clinic or at Johns Hopkins or at Harvard, they can address Latino issues, even though in Rochester, Minnesota, they're not really studying a lot of Latinos. We can allow them to get into that science by sending them cell lines with the genetic features that are most important to Latinos. So I'm super excited about this marriage of outreach to the South Bay and uh, staying true to our really strong neuroscience roots up in, this, in, in the La Jolla type area. Great. That's really exciting. Thank you very much. Um, if no one has anything to add on that, I've got a, a question for Dr. Chun. Uh, regarding the lower incidence of uh, Alzheimer's and HIV positive patients treated with RTIs, um, have reverse transcriptase inhibitors also been shown to reverse AIDS-related dementia? Um, are there any sort of drawbacks, um, deterrence to taking HIV medications? At this point, it's important to note that there have been no prospective uh, clinical trials to look at that specific question. So everything is retrospective and uh, or gleaned. Can I interrupt you? Could you explain the difference between uh, those two types of studies? Right. So prospective trials are where uh, you actually design uh, an experiment and uh, then run it under defined conditions with defined patient populations and uh, look at what uh, a, an outcome of that trial, uh, whether that outcome is actually attained or not. It's kind of like calling your shot in pool, you know, corner pocket shot, you make it or you don't. And uh, I think that's, this is something that, that Paul, of course, could tell you a lot more about. Uh, so the prospective trials uh, contrast with looking retrospectively at uh, large data sets or the literature. And so what we've been doing is to look more at that latter group. Uh, the, the advantage of that is that in, in some cases you can have many, 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 many more uh, data points. For example, a standard clinical trial might have several thousands, whereas a retrospective might have many tens of thousands. And so the signal can emerge from uh, that type of analysis. So uh, at this point, uh, there are signals. Uh, they, they aren't um, publicly available uh, at that, from a peer reviewed journal at, at this stage, but we're hoping to uh, get those out in you know, the, the coming you know, short period of time. So we'll see, see how, that, how that works. But the short answer is that we don't have specific dementia trials that have gone on. We do have signals. I would love to see the, uh, the clinical community to uh, start looking at this from the standpoint of uh, prospective clinical trials. And there are in fact some very, very early small uh, population, small cohort uh, studies that are beginning or have begun. 
uh, but they're they're very early stage. Uh, they could certainly uh, benefit from you know the the resources uh, that NIH is providing to some of the other centers. Thank you. Promising and exciting. Uh, Dr. Chung, I have a question for you, um, both in the, the local work uh, that C4C is doing, but also uh, more broadly. Can you speak to um, what research is happening in non-Alzheimer's uh, dementia? As we have a lot of interest in the group today regarding Lewy body dementia uh, in particular, as well as uh, frontotemporal dementia. So can you speak to the state of things? So with regard to uh, Lewy body and FTD, um, we have not funded a direct, uh, there wasn't any letter of intent that came directly addressed those two targets. Um, it was, uh, the mechanisms were common. There was one uh, uh, funding with NBANG and also with uh, Don Cleveland where uh, what was the target could have impacts for frontal temporal dementia and some Lewy body work. Um, and Bang at Sanford Burnham independently has actually been working on Lewy body uh, and FTD uh, studies. They weren't funded uh, directly by um, the uh, C4C projects, but it's in it's through the U.S. Air Force and it's really in tied on with the overall uh, theme for getting model systems. In a, in a dish using those induced pluripotent stem cells. So that's what's going on there. Um, one of the other things about C4C projects that also then fund they get grants is, and during that process, often we actually form additional collaborations uh, on a funded grant or in a grant application with other centers that we take the principal investigator here that has the initial bit of data, then we partner with some additional data from yet another collaborator outside. So we, we're always looking to leverage and amplify what we do. So that's probably the best answer I can give you. Thank you. Uh, this question is very broad. I don't have anyone in particular to, to ask this of. So I'll just ask you to, to chime in if, if you have some information about this. Um, can anyone comment on any positive or negative uh, known effects of cannabis? Um, on Alzheimer's disease um, in, in terms of treatment, risk reduction, um, impact on caregivers. I think there's um, lots of opportunity here. Um, I'd like to I, go first. I can okay. comment on that. So um, cannabis, of course, is increasingly used for recreational purposes and tried for various symptoms of different diseases. In Alzheimer's disease, I think the most intriguing possibility for cannabis and, and related compounds is in relieving the symptoms of late stage disease. When uh, agitation and uh, depression and uh, uh, behavioral disturbances are highly prevalent, there is some limited evidence, but encouraging evidence that cannabinoids uh, may be helpful. And uh, we actually now have um, uh, a plan in place to launch a trial of synthetic cannabinoids in late stage dementia to try to relieve the manifestations of uh, hospice eligible individuals with dementia, so the very latest stage. As in all potential therapeutics, and this comes back to what Gerald said a few minutes ago, it's really important to conduct prospective randomized trials. It's the only way that we will find out. And so we're happy to have on our, uh, in our plans, a randomized controlled trial of cannabinoids to relieve the symptoms of end-stage dementia. Wonderful. Exciting news. I know a lot of people will be happy to hear that uh, development. Thank you for that update. Um, Dr. Mosbach, is anything happening in this area with regard to caregiver health and stress? As far as I know, I have not seen anything. We had initially started collecting some data and unfortunately we haven't got around to it. Just asking caregivers, um, do they have use of cannabis and 
then we collect information about their stress and depression levels. Um, so we'll have to get around to looking at those data. I don't think we have a lot of it. And um, keep your eyes out. We may have something coming out within the next year or so. Now that I've been sparked to go back and look, look at the data, we did collect it sort of in, impromptu as we started getting questions about it at uh, various presentations and conferences. So, But at this point, I don't have any answers in terms of the impact of uh, cannabis on stress and, and well-being of caregivers. Okay, thank you. Well, it's something to look forward to then. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sefji, I wonder if you could just speak to uh, the, the difference in, in terms of a, a person's participation in a clinical trial in a setting such as yours um, versus participation in, a, in an academic or a healthcare setting. What would, could they expect to see anything different? It would really depend on the type of study. If it's a um, randomized placebo-controlled trial, then it would be exactly the same at my site as at any other site. Uh, if it's more an observational study or uh, they, they, universities and academic institutions are able to do other studies, all those studies at an independent clinical trial site are the ones funded by pharmaceutical companies testing new medications. So, but otherwise, I mean, in terms of the process, uh, it should be exactly the same. Okay, thank you. And there's a, a lot of misconceptions out there about what, what, what these private uh, research institutions are all about. So thanks for the opportunity to let us know more about that. Uh, this question is for Dr. Plopper. Um, and I choose you because I know you do a lot of um, you do you work with me in doing a lot of education uh, directly with the community. So I know that you see this question a lot yourself from our folks. Um, is there any credibility uh, to the sort of the integrative or functional uh, doctors, healthcare providers out there who uh, who suggest that they can they can get to the root cause of dementia, fix or cure that cause? I think there's um, some, some well-known best-selling uh, um, writers out there, uh, and uh, we get a lot of questions in this regard. So what would you say to that? Um, I would say um, <laughs> that's really a um, kind of a loaded question, Amy. The, um, uh, we, um, there's an awful lot of information and misinformation out there. Uh, relative to uh, integrative medicine and ways that we can affect uh, our uh, brains. Uh, there are some, you know, there's a, there are supplements that are um, advertised on television, one of which called Prevagen, which is essentially worthless. And, uh, but they're very slick advertising. Uh, so the, uh, the answer is that, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really fairly simple in terms of what we need to do to do our best to prevent dementia. Uh, and that is to take good care of ourselves. It really has a lot to do with how, what we ingest, how we interact with the world, um, and um, how we interact interpersonally, and how we act physically. So we need to watch what we eat. And the best information we have is that a uh, Mediterranean diet is probably the best uh, approach to uh, uh, doing our best to uh, stave off dementia. That would be vascular dementia as well, and especially. The, uh, uh, we need to interact socially with people, and that's especially difficult now during COVID in terms of uh, the effect on folks and their capability of being the social beings that we, that we truly are. And uh, this is having an effect on people and their, and their ability to cope. And, but being social beings helps us to uh, do our best to stave off dementia. And then what we do physically, the uh, various types of exercise have been shown to, to benefit um, uh, us and to, to prevent dementia. The, uh, uh, there's a lot of information about this. There was a recent study that demonstrated that among older people who have memory impairment, uh, they compared a, an exercise group to a group doing just stretching. And after a year, the exercise group of moderately vigorous exercise over the course of a year had 47% uh, better cognitive tests than those who only stretched. 
So, uh, so on examination, it was found that uh, there was uh, better improvement through people who exercised than people who were sedentary. So in terms of all the information out there about integrative medicine and all the supplements and everything that we can possibly take, it really comes down to fundamentals and what we can do to take care of ourselves uh, when we're younger and throughout our lives. Uh, and those, those, those uh, admonitions in terms of how to take care of ourselves don't change with our age. <clears throat> it's just as important uh, for an older person to be doing these things as a younger person to, to prevent dementia. Thank you for a very uh, fair uh, response. I appreciate that. Thanks for dealing with my heavily loaded question. That's right. Um, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, Dr. Chung, I think I'll direct this one at you, but uh, anyone else feel free to jump in. Um, are there treatments uh, for Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia that are currently being used in other countries with uh, positive looking results that are not yet approved here? Ah, that's a loaded question too, and I'm going to actually have to pass on that. I'm not really not actually up on the literature on the foreign countries. I mean, uh, as uh, Dr. Popper said, you know, in the popular press, there are all sorts of supplements and slick things, and I get bombarded with them as much as anyone else. And mm -hmm. I would, um, you know, I would be very skeptical of anything. It, my attitude is if it's a food supplement and you can take grams of it and you're going to just mostly excrete it, I don't. I don't think it makes you feel better. It helps you. It's like a placebo effect. De do it, right? Someone, it wouldn't help me because I'm so skeptical. It would have no placebo effect. But, right. um, um, you know, I, I subscribe to fish oil, oil, for, uh, you know, omega 3s. These are things that the literature and scientific research has shown. So I tend to stay with those kinds of things. But um, I myself am large on a plant based diet. I exercise regularly and uh, I do feel like I'm having memory lapses now and then, I think it's no more aging. And I think that's the key thing is we're talking about a disease process that takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And that's masked with the general um, risk factors associated with aging. And until we can stop aging, I think we're all going to age. So um, that's, that's the only thing I can, uh, I'm more or less avoiding the question. So I'll pass it on to someone else. <laughs> Does anyone have anything to add there about yeah. Uh, Thank you. If I could address that, but actually, first, I wanted to strongly endorse Michael's comments to your previous question. Um, the best evidence is to take care of yourself, uh, exercise, stay active, stay socially active. Many people, though, are trying, many individuals and groups try to take advantage of the enormous need that people with dementia, their family members or people worried about it, the enormous need for advice and they yeah. sell products. And let me just say that if someone is selling something about a treatment or cure, please avoid them. If you come across something, for example, that says the end of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline, to give you a specific example, for example. please avoid that, uh, that advertisement, that program, that book. These are people trying to make money off pseudoscience. The best advice now is to take care of yourself, which does not require that you spend money on a supplement or joining a program. Now, your question about other countries, I, that's a very interesting question. Um, our standards for approving drugs in the U.S., which is uh, with the FDA, requires rigorous evidence of benefit. I think the FDA is a very sound organization. Uh, sometimes they come under criticism for moving too fast or moving too slowly. I actually think they hit uh, uh, the right approach requiring rigor to establish uh, that benefits outweigh um, risks. Um, other countries, uh, some are similar in rigor for approving drugs, and uh, the EMA in Europe is similar to the FDA, and in Japan, the uh, rigor is similar, but in some countries, it's really not. And one medication was approved last year for treatment of Alzheimer's disease in China uh, based on a uh, randomized controlled study. And I would say that um, the evidence in support of that medication is not nearly good enough 
for approval here in the US. And in fact, my own view is that uh, the evidence is not strong enough that the benefits outweigh the risks. I would rely for uh, information on effective treatments, I would rely on the FDA, which is almost always aligned with the EMA, with Europe and with Japan. But outside of those areas, I would be skeptical. Thank you. That's really helpful. I get, I do get a lot of questions on that topic. I appreciate that. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Sefci, I'll, I'll direct this one uh, toward you. What, what level of understanding capacity is required on the part of a person who's living with memory impairment, cognitive impairment, who's got a, a diagnosis or not, um, to be able to participate in a clinical trial? And do you have any suggestions for uh, a care partner who would like to encourage the person that they care for to participate, but they're resistant? So it varies from study to study, but at a minimum, so if the person does not have their own um, legal capacity to um, sign for medical care, then their part study partner has to be their legally authorized representative. Uh, and at a minimum, then the person percent, uh, participating has to be able to give assent or be agreeable to participating in the study. Um, because many of the studies currently going on are for mild cognitive impairment, it's assumed that at least at the beginning of the study, the actual participant will have the capacity to give their own authorization or consent to take part in the study. Uh, that may change over the course of the study if it's a very long study and the illness progresses despite being in the study. Um, in terms of encouraging someone, you know, a lot of times, their resistance is either due to their fears of sort of acknowledging that they have the illness. Uh, it may be fear of the unknown in terms of not understanding what procedures they may have to go through. Um, you know, sometimes we have folks that come to the office and once they see um, that the staff is supportive and, you know, we give them lots of information and we're not really that scary, um, that they're more amenable to participating. Um, but I also, as the principal investigator, am very, very cautious. And if the participant is saying they don't want to do it, then unfortunately we can't enroll them in the study. Thank you. Dr. Mosbach, any um, additional thoughts there as it relates to a care partner who, uh, I, we, we encourage a lot of family caregivers to participate in clinical research. And while there's lots of, um, good intentions and support for that, um, the, the practicalities, the difficulties of their lives um, really present a lot of obstacles to participation. Do you have any suggestions uh, for the overworked, overwhelmed care partner and uh, the benefits of participation in clinical research? Well, I think that that's just it. I mean, there's no guarantee that participation in research provides benefit, but I think that to the extent that it has the uh, potential for that, I think that, uh, you know, the, the strong, as far as my research goes, and I'm interested in what the caregiver is experiencing, uh, my, my belief is that when a caregiver does well, the person that they're caring for does well. And so when you participate in programs, uh, whether they be um, community-based programs like the Alzheimer's San Diego would put on or research programs that might uh, myself or the other researchers might be a part of, to the extent that the caregiver or the person with uh, Alzheimer's or dementia uh, benefits, I think that everyone benefits. It's not just focused only on the person who's participating. It extends beyond to the direct caregivers and the other family members. So, um, uh, when you can get people in, if you can find a way to do that, I think it, it, it could have potential benefits all around. Great, thank you. That, that's a, a, a great way to, to, to frame that more positively for our care partners, I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Doctors Brewer and Plopper, you both spoke to um, some very long-term studies uh, in, your, in your introductions. So um, get questions on that as well. How do, as a person's capacity is changing over time, Dr. Sefci just mentioned, most studies are going to require the participation of a care partner. Um, 
sort of the logistics of that, how does that actually work? How can you keep somebody involved in a study that long over time? And what do people do that, that don't have a dedicated care partner but want to participate in research? Let either I, one of you take I, that. Can I start off with that? Because I think it's really, uh, it's been impressive to see what, uh, what we've experienced at the Shiley Marcos ADRC because we've had participants that have been with us over 30 years. And these are, these are not the cognitively impaired individuals at the beginning, although we have followed individuals who have developed from uh, healthy, uh, healthy uh, control participant who, who then started having problems over the course of 20 to 30 years because we've been in place, we've been able to see it. We, it's amazing the kind of, uh, uh, partnership that we form we have almost it's almost like a family that uh, that develops we, we really develop strong bonds to our participants because they've been uh, with us for so long and helping us in our work for so long some of them just sign up for almost every ancillary study that we have because mm -hmm. they're so dedicated to the science of trying to cure this disease so that would be one of the pieces but and and the the challenge of this particular illness is that it progresses so slowly that one needs to follow a person over what would sometimes be in a person's entire academic career. And this, this ADRC has been in place over, you know, three, four different leaders now because, uh, you know, we've had you know, the original leaders pass away. And uh, so, but, and yet the participants are still there the whole time. The fact that this disease progresses so slowly, it makes it very hard to detect a subtle decline in as short a time as six months, which you'd like to be able to say, does this drug work in six months? Well, you can't tell because the disease progresses so slowly. We're getting a little bit of a better chance because of the uh, in vivo biomarkers that we can do where we can look directly at the brain um, uh, atrophy that's taking place. And we can detect that in as short a time as three months through a baseline MRI scan and a follow-up scan just three months later. And the computer can detect really, really subtle changes in the cortical margin of the brain and say, hey, this person may not know it yet, but their brain is shrinking faster than one would expect and there's hope that that might be an ancillary measure that would allow us to get a better readout on drugs without having to wait for three four years um, uh, also the the pet scanning approaches so looking at amyloid and it definitely we've de seen as paul alluded to we do know drugs can remove amyloid from the brain the question is will it actually affect the cognitive impairment and the trajectory of disease we now at least have that readout that says, yes, the amyloid is gone. The question is, are we gonna to have to do it earlier or what is the impact of doing this at what stage of the disease? The next measure, which I saw in the question and answer, what about this new, newly approved, FDA approved agent called tau pet imaging? That is going to be, I think, a game changer because it really does link up with the in vivo pathology that relates to cognitive impairment. So uh, similar to what I say about where we can look at the detective, detect the changes in cortical thickness of your brain, the, where, the area where the cells are, we see that shrink, almost in the exact same areas as where the tau is depositing. And so being able to do that in a single shot rather than having to wait over six months would allow us to be able to say, hey, this person has the pathology that's damaging brain tissue and put in a drug at whatever stage and see if that tau is, is uh, responding to that. I think there's a lot of power that we might be able to shorten these trials, but for right now, because the cognitive impairment is so slowly, we have to follow people over several years in order to detect to change. And Mike, if you wanna add anything to that, that's fine. <clears throat> Just to add on to that, Jim, uh, I think it's very, very well put. The, um, I'm forever amazed at uh, the commitment of people uh, when they become involved in clinical trials. It's, 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 it's amazing. And uh, they're very reliable. They stay in the trials. They, uh, even if a person may not be directly benefiting, obviously, uh, they continue to stay because there's this, this strong sense of altruism that people are actually helping others as well as themselves. Um, and again, it's just, it's just remarkable the extent to which people become committed to this. I think the, you know, we have to keep in mind is the, the severity of pathology that ultimately happens in our brain and, and we're not going to be able to take care of that in, in a matter of months or, or maybe a year. I mean, as, as Jim was alluding to this, 
this, uh, you know, this disorder requires a lengthy intervention and potent intervention. Uh, people are entering the, the preclinical trials uh, before the disease has actually become symptomatic. So they, they um, you know, uh, may end up developing Alzheimer's disease, probably will because they have biomarkers for it, but uh, it, it remains to be seen over time. And there will be people who naturally progress over those several years, and then there'll be people who really don't. And we have to be able to differentiate, um, uh, you know, natural progression and uh, then sort of the different sort of pathways people take and, and time that it takes for, um, uh, for progression uh, and factor that into the trials. But these things take time. And um, the other thing is that you are receiving medical care. You're receiving attention during this time. You're getting laboratories done. You're getting imaging routinely. Uh, you're receiving the intervention versus placebo. And, and, almost, and almost all these trials have a placebo arm, which we have to reference. And that is that uh, the FDA requires it and good science requires having a, a placebo control. Uh, so, you know, the, these, these are um, important and uh, elements of, of research that we have to keep in mind and, and factor for. But, they, but people um, just uh, uh, care about it. They, they get to know the staff. Uh, we're a little less concerned about uh, placebo response in these trials because we have so much in the way of objective measures. We're looking at cognitive testing, uh, which is objective. We're looking at uh, imaging, which is objective. And so we have these measures of improvement. So the fact that our staff can be supportive and helpful of people along the way, contrary to certain other types of trials, uh, is a little bit less important in this. We're able to help people during the, these periods of time. And we turn out to be an important uh, uh, source of support for people over these years. And so um, uh, I've not found the lengthy duration of trials to be a huge impediment to, to, to successful conduct of trials. And, and I'll just amplify that altruism piece that Michael mentioned. It's just, uh, it is remarkable. Our center has been really a, a leader in the study of cerebrospinal fluid, which means that our participants, uh, even though they, they don't clinically need a lumbar puncture, they'll say, I'm gonna do this for the science and to help uh, uh, move things forward. Now, luckily, because we do so many of them, most of them say, that's a lumbar puncture. I heard so many bad things about it. That was nothing, you know, but uh, still it's kind of brave. We require those brave heroes to join in and say, I'm willing to do a lumbar puncture. And most of them say, I'll do it again, you know, in three years, just in case something's changing. Uh, luckily, I think as Paul alluded to, we're getting better at actually measuring from the blood. So some of these key markers of amyloid and tau uh, because of the help of uh, these other markers as gold standards, we've been able to develop better markers of the uh, disease from plasma. So that's going to be a lot easier. Although as a neurologist, I feel like a lumbar puncture isn't a, as big of a deal because we usually most, again, most people say that wasn't very big of a deal. And it's still very important to get this fluid that's bathing the brain. You can imagine all this stuff that is going to teach us uh, about what the process is in living people by by collecting that fluid. Now, I will mention, we've relieved that, uh, that uh, requirement uh, for our Latino cohort. So, in fact, in order to enhance uh, recruitment of Latinos, we've said, if you don't want to uh, opt in on a lumbar puncture, you don't need to. Uh, although many of them still do. And we just applied for an imaging supplement from the NIA to allow us to pay for the very expensive PET scan approach to characterize our entire cohort. So, uh, and again, altruism side, because we don't yet really have the linkage between an individual's genetic background, these polygenic hazard scores that we do where we measure your entire genome, but we don't necessarily want to just roll that back to our participants. So it is really altruistic, like we are collecting it, we're studying it. We're going to know about it hopefully soon so that we can tell you what it means. But before we know what it means, we don't want to add that extra burden of knowledge to you because uh, it can add a lot of stress to say, oh, you're a double E4 carrier. And, you know, even though it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get Alzheimer's disease during your life, you go on the internet and it, and it causes tremendous distress. So 
I think uh, in order to be cautious, we've really kept that inside of our ADRC. And there was a question about this. Uh, are we returning all of these results, amyloid positive, tau positive, genetic features and stuff? We tend to keep that in until we know really more about what it means. Great. Sound strategy. Thank you. Thank you both very much for, uh, for clarifying that, um, what that length of participation means and might look like for someone. Um, I have a really interesting, a really good question uh, sitting here um, that I think I could direct at any one of you, but I'm going to pick on Dr. Chun because I haven't uh, in a while. You're looking kind of relaxed over there in your Hawaiian shirt. So I'll lay this one on you, but I welcome anyone else's uh, input on this. We are hearing about today and, and more broadly about all of these innovative new treatments, new drugs that are on the horizon. Um, but what about Aricept? Right. Can we just pause for a second? Um, can you tackle this question? Does Aricep help? Well, that's probably uh, Paul or Jim could give you a, even a better answer there. I mean, my understanding of this is it's uh, an anticholinesterase inhibitor that uh, prevents some of the uh, or addresses some of the symptomatology. It is not what we consider a disease modifying therapy. And in some portion of the population of AD patients, uh, there, there is some uh, behavioral benefit, but it won't change the overall course of the disease. So it is an FDA approved agent. Uh, it is not a disease modifying therapy. And then yeah. I'll turn it over or turn it back to uh, Paul and Jim. Thank you, Dr. Asen. Um, what about that? Um, it, the, the, behavior or symptom modifying effects of Aricept. Can you speak to them? Yeah, so the simple answer to your question is, yes, Aricept works. It's been tested in rigor multiple rigorous uh, randomized placebo-controlled trials, and it helps people with uh, the dementia stage of Alzheimer's disease. So it's not helpful at the asymptomatic stage. It doesn't prevent the disease but people who have symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's at the mild or moderate or even severe stage of dementia, they will be helped by Aricep. The benefit's modest, but uh, it's a measurable benefit and it can help people and their families. It relieves some of the cognitive dysfunction. That is, your cognitive performance, your memory improves while you're taking the drug, but your cognitive performance continues to decline. Um, it's not, as Gerald said, it's not a disease modifying agent. So it is not going to prevent progression, but as long as you take Aricept, there will be a modest benefit in terms of your brain function. Thank you. Would anyone add anything? To that, any additional comments? Yes, Dr. Sachi. Um, I would just like to add that what they said is true for all the agents that are currently FDA approved for treatment of Alzheimer's. It's not just Aricept. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, this is another one of those questions. I'm not quite sure where to direct it, so I will um, just float it out there uh, for all of you. Um, Participation in, in research, can you speak to, uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, Dr. Brewer and UCSD's efforts to reach the Latinx population down in the South Bay here in San Diego County, um, but what if more broadly, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, what level of participation are we seeing in uh, clinical trials um, broadly? And do you have any suggestions on what we should be doing uh, to better reach these populations. Um, I, I mean, I, know I spoke mostly about the Latino uh, core, uh, and it is probably where San Diego fits uh, most into this broader effort. Uh, we, we clearly are interested in recruiting diversities of all, uh, uh, of all types. Uh, the, the real, leader in the nation, I think, uh, in this effort for African-American recruitment. And we learn a lot from them. We go to their conferences uh, in order to apply some of their same approaches to reaching out to other cultures is Washington University in St. Louis. 
they've really, really taken this on in a, in a major way, almost in the way that we've taken on the, the Latino uh, question. And uh, very, very important uh, things that we're learning from them. And the other centers uh, across the nation, there's about, uh, there's over 30 uh, Alzheimer's disease research centers funded by the NIA across the nation are all being strongly encouraged to, to really make sure that we don't leave out this uh, topic of, of, just like I spoke to, I mean, it's so important that we understand much more than just the European aspects of this disease. So I, mm -hmm. I very much strongly uh, uh, support the, the efforts that are taking place across the nation. Amy, if I could just add to that. Please. There uh, is a need uh, for clinical trials to test therapies in a group that represents the entire population. So our clinical trials should have enrollment that looks like the diversity of the US. And we have failed. Um, pharmaceutical trials, academic trials, they have all failed for a variety of reasons, but they have failed. And to address this failure, uh, we and, and, and others are devoting substantial resources to improving the diversity in our clinical trials population. Uh, we, we are um, getting help from a number of organizations uh, around the country. Um, we are changing the face of investigators to be more representative. That is, we are uh, developing a broader um, group of investigators that will um, reach out more effectively to the entire population. I think we have a ways to go, but I think the good news is that uh, we are committed, we being the, the clinical research community, we are committed to testing therapies in representative populations. And I think we are now launching um, very strong strategies to get us there. I'll just add too, um, the NIH in particular, which I'm most familiar with, um, they do require every researcher to describe their specific plan for diversity of research participants, what they're going to do, how they're going to ensure this. They also require researchers to update the NIH annually, at least to describe the um, ethnicity and racial diversity of their research participants. And NIH actually now um, has research mechanisms, grant mechanisms devoted to um, solely on research for ethnic and racial diverse populations. And I've been a part of the research grant uh, review process that looks at grants focused on this. So there's, there's an increased effort on their part and more needs to be done, but um, there's a, we can at least be sure that there's a, there's a pathway going forward that I think is positive. Thank you. Thanks for all of your thoughts and contributions on that. Um, we are getting close on our time, just bringing that to everyone's attention. And I also just want to point out we have um, dozens of questions left unanswered. Uh, we will do our best here, but um, we acknowledge we won't get to every question. Um, but here's another one. Uh, brain donation. Uh, I heard some mention of um, pathologic studies. Um, is brain donation needed and what should people do if they're um, interested? Yay, thank you. I'm jumping in right off the bat. Great. Great. <laughs> we have it's all yours. the largest uh, brain banks in the nation. In fact, uh, thousands of brains in the center, very well characterized individuals have been followed across their life span and at least in the later stages of their life. Uh, and they uh, do this very important gift, which is giving the brain at the end of it. Uh, I will say that um, we often get called by individuals who we've not followed and we have no clinical information, no, uh, nothing other than my father or someone died with Alzheimer's disease, we'd like to donate the brain. In our center, we, we don't um, collect those brains because we need to have the connection to what was happening during life. We, it's really most important to us to have the, uh, the characterization of the individual prior to death and then the post-mortem characterization. And it's quite costly to do the, uh, autopsy. It's uh, at least a couple thousand dollars, which we pay for for our participants, but for individuals who are not our participant, even if the family's willing to pay for it, 
uh, there, there's still costs of storing and understanding that having other brains in the ba bank with, who have not been as well characterized, then I think uh, we have not, we've not taken those brains. So that, uh, that's where I would say it. it's a very, very important aspect of our science in the center. Uh, but for us to collect the brain, the individual had to be followed in the brain, uh, followed in the study. The, uh, there may be other endeavors though, and I think we have some contacts for people that are willing just to take the brain um, um, in conjunction with maybe genetic studies post done post-mortem. Um, we have considered this in the Latino cohort as well. Uh, because there, it's it's relatively uh, it's quite important to make that linkage between genetics and autopsy findings, uh, but in in general, we've only taken brains when an individual has uh, already participated in our study. But uh, contact the center if you will have more questions on that. Great, thank you. Amy, may I follow up on that? Please. Yeah, I know it's it's absolutely essential that uh, we get the really the widest range of. Uh, autopsy donations that of course include the brain but other parts of the body as well and it is rate limiting for our studies and as you've heard there's lots of data to cure mouse alzheimer's but we know so little really to this day uh, about some of the fine details of the brain itself even in the normal case which is important but especially in the alzheimer's disease setting so UCSD does have a body donation program through which non-disease samples can also come through if they don't come through the, the ADRC, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And uh, that, that is just an essential um, component of all of this. And we have absolutely relied and benefited uh, from, from access to those materials. But there's actually even one more step that has um, now arisen especially through NIH funded research, which is the primary supporter of all of our studies. And that is that in today's sequencing centric uh, approaches, they're so powerful that at some point, maybe in the not too distant future, if you sequenced to the nth degree material from an anonymous uh, autopsy, you might be able to somehow figure out who that individual actually is. Now, there's nothing pernicious about this. It's not some great evil plot or anything like that. But what it does uh, mandate now is that some of these uh, donors actually consent legally to donating their body for this type of sequencing information. We refer to it as an open consent. And that is gonna turn out to be another rate limiting aspect to our ability to share all of this information and have it mined, so to speak, to, to look through the big data uh, by all of the community. And so at, if you can uh, look into this, for those of you uh, so interested, the open consenting step really does open doors for the entire community. And it'll have not just for San Diego, which is of course important, but really for the entire world to be able to uh, understand some of the changes that we've, we've talked about today. Thank you. Open consenting, that's a whole new concept to me. I think I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I am going to, um, two more questions. Okay, uh, what, uh, I, I think this question is for Dr. Asen. Uh, you let me know. What biomarker tests are currently available um, to people that are not in a research study uh, and how are they accessed? Well, um, there are a number of biomarkers that are available. Um, the most uh, informative biomarkers have been approved by the FDA, and they are amyloid PET scanning and tau PET scanning. And these are the brain imaging methods that allow us to see the plaques and tangles. Um, those are available to anybody since they've been approved by the FDA. However, they have not been approved for reimbursement by CMS. Um, CMS has determined that uh, um, spending money on these is uh, not yet yielding sufficient clinical benefit. That's a difficult question. I 
understand, though don't agree with that decision, but the way things stand now, amyloid PET and tau PET are available but are not reimbursable. And the cost to an individual will be something like uh, five to eight thousand dollars per scan. So they are not widely used. Their uh, uh, value to research is enormous. Their value to clinical care is significant, but I would say that the fact that they're not widely used is not uh, terribly detrimental to clinical care because clinical assessment itself gives much of the information that we need to provide advice and clinical care to individuals. Uh, the other approved test is the APOE genetic test. And it would take a while to discuss the pros and cons of people having that test. It doesn't tell you anything about what's happening to you now. It tells something about your genetic risk of having Alzheimer's disease during your lifetime. And people can get that at fairly low cost through services like uh, 23andMe. Um, the problem is they don't always get enough information about what the result means and what the result does not mean. So on balance, I'm not sure it does more uh, good than harm to go out and get APOE testing, unless it's uh, under the direction of a knowledgeable clinician. Great, thank you. So now uh, I, I'm gonna ask my final question, but I, I will, and this came from, from one of our attendees, but I am going to ask it of all of you. I'd like to hear each of your individual responses to it. Um, what is the most promising bit of news, a development, something that you've seen um, within this last year? I'll start with uh, Dr. Chung. Well, uh, we are closest to the work that we do. And uh, I, I think the notions that I, I talked about, about mosaicism and the effects on specific disease genes that is something that is real, and that is something that is not currently really interrogated by even the current therapies that are being clinically trialed. Uh, the reverse transcriptase inhibitors look, again, as promising as they did from the initial uh, reports. And so I think by looking at that altogether, there's, there's certainly a, a new facet that we can now explore and the community can community can now explore. So that, that's what uh, keeps me uh, excited for the future, along with all of what you heard today. Great. Thank you. Uh, TC, Dr. Chung, what would, you, what would you say the most exciting thing you've seen in the last year? Well, I think um, I'm actually particularly excited with uh, Paul Aysen's, you know, findings and the mapping of this 25-year progression and that, you know, um, the, if we have ways of detecting the accumulation of, of A beta early. Now, of course, I'm more interested in prevention and early intervention because I think if, like most uh, disease progression, it takes a long time. The earlier you start, the more impact you can have later. That's confounding and a bit challenging because it's not the normal drug paradigm for pharmaceutical companies that want to treat senior fact and you can buy a pill, right? But we all are going to get older and, uh, you know, there's going to be a higher prevalence of people because we do live longer. I mean, you can clearly age and not develop Alzheimer's. So that's really the, the thing. The real question is when to treat. So I think we treat too late. So I think there's the finding that you can find it early and look for that is very important and quite exciting, I think. So that's what I would focus on right now. Uh, also, the fact, one thing I did want to, um, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we talk about A-beta as being pathological. So A-beta is a normal protein and we do have it in our bodies. And in fact, it's protective. So if you have a traumatic brain injury, you get high levels of A-beta, but it's rapidly cleared. So it's not that you have A-beta, it's the fact it accumulates or is not properly cleared. So that's the pathological condition. So treating that early and seeing that early, I think to me gives the greatest hope for longer lasting impact. And from a purely financial side, it does, uh, you can have a person on a drug for their entire lifetime. Of course, that would be, you know, profit would come from that. However, the safety margins would have to be huge and that's a challenge. Thank you. Difficult balance there. 
Dr. Sefci, what, what's the most exciting thing you've seen in the last year? Oh, you're muted. Um, actually, some of the most exciting things have been what I've heard here today. Uh, from a practical standpoint, um, aducanumab is the first drug in a long time that looks like it may get FDA approval. Um, I think I'm most inspired by the fact that pharmaceutical companies continue to come out with new clinical trials and, and look at new targets for new medications, and they have not given up on investing money in this space to try to find something to treat Alzheimer's. Thank you. I know there was a lot of concern, and over a year ago or so, we were hearing a lot of that. Gosh, are people going to are people going to leave this space? So, yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Plopper. What would you say? Well, actually, uh, Dr. S she stole my thunder there. I, the aducanumab map has to be mentioned as uh, uh, a very exciting development. That you know, finally, a disease modifying agent is in front of the FDA. So we'll see what happens with that. But it's really the vitality and energy in the, in the field today. I mean, given mm -hmm. the fact we have had uh, a number of failures in recent years, uh, the, it, it, it's going on unabated. The uh, clinical trials are, are strong. The uh, researchers like Paul are, are generating um, uh, very important clinical trials to uh, enable us to, to get closer to an answer. And um, just, it's just the energy, and the energy in the field today is, is significant, and I've been most encouraged by that in the past year. Wonderful. Here, here, Dr. Mosbach. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just say uh, uh, three things, actually. Uh, the National Institute on Aging uh, has always been interested in funding caregiver uh, research. Um, but more recently, in the past several years, they've actually been setting aside money specific to researchers who are interested in looking at interventions or research programs designed to aid the caregiver in the process of providing care to their loved ones. And so um, this has really sparked an interest, of course, on the part of researchers who want to go for that money. But I think it's, it's sparking novel ideas, novel uh, research that's coming about. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by that, that the National Institute on Aging is devoting specific money for this kind of work. Um, there's also been, for the past 30 years, uh, there has been research looking at what helps the caregiver. And we've found interventions that have been very helpful. But the problem is a lot of the information just kind of ends up on a bookshelf somewhere and dust starts collecting and those interventions don't actually make it out to community-based agencies or providers who might otherwise be able to help the caregiver. And so the shift has also been towards implementation. What can we do to encourage people and test to see if, it's, if we provide these interventions out in community-based settings? So I think that's been great from my perspective because it actually increases access for caregivers to get the kind of care and the kind of help that they need. Um, so I'll just stop there. I'll just say those two things have been really encouraging for me. That is encouraging. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, that unique perspective there. Um, Dr. Brewer, what would you say has been the most exciting development of the last year? Well, I have to say uh, the most exciting is the launch of the Center for Brain Health and Memory Disorders at UC San Diego. <laughs> I, uh, no, I, uh, but I do want to mention it because I think it's been an effort for the San Diego community. It's, uh, it's long been a reputation at UC San Diego that we've been leading the nation and world in Alzheimer's research, but not really being accessible and open to our patients because we just, we had such long wait lists and things. So it, to, to address that as department chair, I hired five new uh, practitioners in dementia to try to be able to help uh, help provide those in, help for individuals that were currently suffering from the disease, not just about uh, help for later. And, and, and two of those providers are uh, bicultural, bilingual. So we'll, and, and the, cent, the new clinic is right there at the same center as the ADRC. So I think it's going to dovetail really beautifully for our clinical trials and our other research studies that uh, take in patients, characterize them and hand them right off to our support groups and our, and our care uh, and our research that's going on there and our partnership with you is going to be very, very helpful in that because we've always wanted to be able to be ready for your referrals and, and provide that care. So that we launched that this year and we're very excited about it. We'll be making a, 
press release about that. But I think on the scientific side, as I mentioned, or at least briefly alluded to, the ability to use genetic information in new ways has been the greatest thing of this last year. The, the ability not only to look at the genetic background, but also the transcriptome, what, what parts of the genome are actually opening up and transcribing proteins in a, new, in a way that's different in Alzheimer's disease than in uh, non-Alzheimer's disease or other illnesses. So, the, so, so understanding that and, and knowing the impact of each different cell type, that was one of my slides that I put in there. I couldn't talk about it a long time, but there was a new science paper out of our center that was, I think it's really, really exciting to do that approach. And dovetailing with the rare variants in Alzheimer's disease that are found to be protective. That, that in fact, no matter what your ApoE status is, this previously it was the Icelandic mutation, now there's a Christchurch mutation, these little rare genetic mutations that are highly protective. And if we can mimic that, and if we can use antisense oligonucleotides or other great advances that have happened over the past year, I encourage you to look up that because it's an amazing story in neurology, basically a heat seeking missile to the nervous system that you can change the payload for, I think it's a promising new approach. And so those are the things I think are, mo are, are most exciting to me right now. And, and it was a great year. All right, it's hard to dispute. Uh, thank you um, and, and congratulations on, on If I can just jump in uh, with Jim Brewer's uh, reference about the SMA uh, antisense oligo, I just wanted to educate everyone. It, it's, a, it's a key thing that drugs are very important uh, they have their effects by the root of administration. So actually, if you had asked me if antisense would have worked in the brain, I would have said no, and I've been very skeptical. But in fact, they took a liability of these uh, antisense, which are they're rapidly cleared, and they're not great in the blood. And they actually inject it in the intrathecal space, so where it sits and can persist for a long time. So what's amazing by this is a single injection lasts, what, three to six months, and it is curative. So that's why it has, that's a really unexpected finding to take a liability and actually make it an advantage. Wow. Hmm. Thank you. That's, um, that's innovative. <laughs> Goodness sakes. Uh, Dr. Asen, um, I'd like to, to end with you. Um, what, what would you say is the most exciting development of the, of the past year for you? So I would agree that this has been a, tremendously exciting year. Um, there's a huge amount going on in the field, many studies across the spectrum with, of disease, many different approaches, and a wonderful degree of collaboration and data sharing, and a major increase in NIH funding. All of these come together to make us very excited. But the single most exciting thing I would say is the launch of trials of agents that remove amyloid before any symptoms occur and while the brain is still healthy is the most exciting attack on this disease to date. Thank you. Uh, this, this all is very exciting. Um, go ahead and I hate to do this. Um, I hate to wrap it up, but it is time. In fact, it is over time. I have been so deeply inspired and excited um, by all of the information that you've each delivered. Um, I see in our questions, I see in our chat, um, that there's lots of enthusiasm. Of course, lots more questions and lots more interest, but thank you all so much. Um, the, the, the ability to contribute in this, in this uh, online setting. It's, it feels awkward and it's limited. I know that in a lot of ways, but um, your information and insights are much appreciated. So good to see some very real concrete progress being made um, toward finding a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, so a reminder to everyone watching, as you have heard a few times here this morning, we cannot find a cure without you. Um, the first person that is cured of Dementia will be someone in a clinical trial. Um, and I'm pleased to report there are still dozens of research studies happening locally um, that continue through the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you'd like to learn more about local opportunities to participate in clinical research, how you can help, please contact us at Alzheimer's San Diego. Uh, we can point you in the right direction, whatever your area of interest is. 
Um, in the chat box, you'll see a link where you can go, uh, you can just click right on that and request follow-up. Uh, and one of Alzheimer's San Diego social workers will follow up with you uh, for, and get you more information about whatever you're looking for. So go ahead and fill that out. Um, if you're looking for information on clinical trials, education, support and discussion groups, our virtual companion program, uh, whatever it might be. And finally, just want to make a, another quick reminder about our online scavenger hunt. Um, it was included in the email that was provided in the link that you got uh, for this webinar. So if you haven't already, please take a few moments sometime over the weekend and complete it. Um, once you submit it uh, and you don't have to get all the answers correct, um, you'll automatically be entered into a $50 gift certificate uh, to win a $50 gift certificate to the Cone Restaurant Group. So you have until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. We will not accept any entries that come in after that um, to submit. This is a great way to learn more about our partners, but um, specifically to learn more about local research opportunities. Once again, I thank this amazing panel for sharing their Saturday morning with us, and I thank all of you for coming. I hope you left with more knowledge and more hope about the search for a cure. Thank you.